All right, open your Bibles to Acts chapter number 17, and we're going to continue on. Uh, we were in Kentucky last weekend. Brother Ted Burwell taught down through um, about verse 9. Uh, we're in the midst of Paul's second apostolic journey uh, as, he's, uh, as he's traveling and establishing Gentile churches. Um, see if we got, uh, we've got a map here. He has been, he has started in Antioch and traveled traveled through, boy, that's a that's kind of fuzzy there, I guess maybe because I played with it a little bit. Um, I tried to lay some of the, the darker text right over the original because you couldn't hardly hardly see it, and I'm going to have to tweak that again. But he had traveled through Asia, um, and from Troas, we've looked at Acts chapter 16, he's in Philippi, and now uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 1, and when they had passed through Ap and Polis and Apollonia they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews so Paul is in Thessalonica and he's ministering to uh, and, and find uh, establishes the church of Thess Thessalonica in nine verses there uh, the book of Acts presents a Jewish emphasis because the issue in the book of Acts is the unbelief of Israel and Israel's demonstrating that they're um, a, a, a disobedient and a gainsaying people and the book of Acts and Luke is not recorded to, as a pattern of doctrine for Gentile ministry. Now, we're, we're going to see some things in the morning service where we can learn what Paul did in the book of Acts and see some amazing things, but his doctrine is found in his epistles. Um, so he ministers in Thessalonica. Um, while the, while the emphasis here is um, three Sabbath days reasoning out of the scriptures and the unbelief of Israel, when you read Thessalonians, he opens up the first chapter and he says um, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a large Gentile presence in here. In fact, if you look at verse 4, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. Those are the Jews. But then he says, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women not a few now devout Greeks those would be those would be Greeks in the synagogue worshiping with Israel but really the fact of the matter is they're all Gentiles because Israel has fallen and there's no difference as Paul goes to goes to these synagogues repeatedly throughout the book of Acts all of them are considered heathen Gentiles um, because they're because the nation of Israel has has fallen, uh, he just he he approaches his audience from a different perspective. With the Jews, he starts with the issue of Abraham and their history and points them to their Messiah, but then preaches the Messiah according to his gospel. That this Jesus through this man has preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and you can be justified from all things. You can have forgiveness. Peter on the day of Pentecost, you remember what he preached? He preached remission. And in Acts chapter 3, their sins were going to be blotted out at the times of refreshing. That's evidence that Paul is preaching the gospel of the grace of God early because he offers complete and total forgiveness and justified from all things. Um, that's, that's Romans truth that he's preaching early. Um, but he starts the Jew with the issue of, of the Messiah and then preaches the Messiah according to his message. With the Gentile, he starts with the issue of creation. We'll see that later when he gets to, when he gets once again in Athens. So he goes through, and he has ministry in Thessalonica. Um, there's persecution and trouble. The, the Jews, the unbelieving Jews at Thessalonica were especially vicious. Um, if you look there at verse 5, the Jews which believed not moved with envy and took unto themselves certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. I love that phrase, that phraseology. Uh, they got some gangbangers and roughed up these early believers that had gotten saved in Paul's ministry. And the persecution continues. And it gets so difficult. Um, verse number, uh, number 8, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things, they go at they they can't find Paul, but they go after his local church. They know where they're meeting. Um, they they're they're meeting in the house of Jason, 
Uh, that's where the, the church of Thessalonica started. But uh, the church of Thessalonica was probably a fairly large group. So um, they, had a, they had a local presence. And that's the issue of a local church. A local church, it's the pillar and the ground of the truth, and it has a testimony in a community. And the authorities and the, the, those that opposed Paul and his ministry, they knew where to look for these people. Um, so they, they troubled the, the people. Verse number 9, when they had taken security of Jason and the other, they let them go. That's a bribe. They, they're, they're wanting to persecute, but they got some money, so they let them go, but they know where to, get, they know where to go if they want to get some more money along the way. Um, they, they, these Jews, it's, a, it's, it's demonstrating something marvelous here um, uh, about, about the intensity of Israel's opposition to God and his word. Um, so verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. There it is again. Over and over again he goes into the synagogue. But as we read these things, don't think that that's the only focus of Paul's ministry. That's the mistake that many make because they read the book of Acts and they see the, the synagogue over and over and over again and just passing reference to Gentiles they think that Paul had a different ministry during the book of Acts than he has um, later on it's one ministry but it's, it's, a, it's a ministry that is expanding as, as Paul is learning more and more truth as God reveals these things to them so he comes to Berea and verse 11 these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Verse 11 is the, the verse in the book of Acts that we get the name for our church from. And the Christian stores and bookstores and so on have taken that name because it's obvious about the issue of being a student of God's word. I have a, had a good friend who's with the Lord now and people used to say, you're a, you know, you're a theologian. He says, no, I'm a Bible student. <laughs> I just love to study the scriptures. And here, the, there's, there's, different, there's different individuals. Um, the, the, the real issue is the heart. Regardless of, of what nationality you, you identify yourself with. Um, so this is the, the place where we get the name for our our church, the Berean Bible Church. There's two things there. They received the word with all readiness of mind. There was an attitude of, okay, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to listen. I'm willing to, I'm, I'm willing to, um, to, to think outside the box. Problem is, a lot of times people think outside the box and they go over a cliff. Um, you should always have a teachable spirit, but then validate the scriptures. Um, he says, and they search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now these are unbelieving Jews, but there's a heart there that um, as, they as they hear Paul teach, they respond to the word of God. And it's the word of God that's the power of God unto salvation. Um, one thing that's interesting here, notice these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Notice the difference in response. He says, verse 12, Therefore many of them believed. Many of them believed also of the honorable women, which were of uh, Greeks and of men, not a few. Almost the same language that we have back in verse 5 in Thessalonica. But notice the difference. Verse 12, it says many of them believed. Verse 5, but the Jews... Um, well, verse 4, and some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks a great multitude and the chief women not a few. You see the subtle difference there? You have many in Thessalonica. The mindset generally was different uh, there in, in Thessalonica. And instead of, it, it, and you know, but you know they're not going to swallow a pig in a poke. They're not going to just you know, because somebody sounds good and they know what they believe, that, oh, you know, and, and see, that's what, what happens. People get tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I guarantee you, somebody who teaches 
has thought about what they want to teach and want to present it, at least they should, in as clear a way as possible. And they can be very persuasive. But you don't want to be tossed to and fro um, with every wind of doctrine. Um, that's what society does. Um, th this is interesting. Go to chapter, chapter 17. Just jump ahead a little bit. Um, let's see. Um, uh, where is the verse here? Um, verse 19. Um, it, as, he, as he's dealing in the marketplace in Athens, they took unto him and brought unto him unto the Areopagus, saying, May we know this new doctrine, and whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. It's real easy to get carried away with a fad. You see those things in, social, in, in, in society all the time. The same thing in Christian circles. Somebody will come up with some new angle, like the prayer of Jabez, or you know, di different, different things, and because it's new, people latch onto it. You know what that tells you? That there's a void, that what they've known and what they stand on really isn't making, meeting their need. And so they just continually hop from one new thing, one new thing to another. Um, you don't want to be that. You want to know what you believe and why you believe it, but be grounded firmly in it and uh, have it confirmed with the scriptures. That's what these Bereans were. Um, they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things are so. Daily intake, intake of Bible doctrine is critically important. You don't want to just live on what you get on Sunday morning. And you don't want to just, you don't want to just ride on another man's nickel. <laughs> you know, it's real easy. Today, there's, we have information in so many different places. On the internet, um, you know, CDs, and uh, in my day, it was cassette tapes. Anybody remember cassette tapes? Okay, you still, you, eight track, but eight track, you didn't have, they didn't record and duplicate. The eight tracks used to be where you got your rock and roll. You know, and uh, um, all, all that stuff. But cassette tapes, I remember, boy, if you had a cassette tape player in your car, you could listen, you know, to, to music, but you could also listen to preaching. What a, what a great thing. And you need to listen and learn from other people. Um, but you also want to feed yourself. Personal intake of Bible doctrine, making the truth your own, is where real growth takes place. And uh, they searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Um, he even tells the Ephesian elders, I believe, um, uh, watch and, and take heed to yourself and to feed the church of God. Personal intake of Bible doctrine is important. I hope you're, re I hope you're readers of the Bible. Um, because as you, as you read the Bible and discover things for yourself, uh, there's, there's a specialness about that. These Bereans were, were marvelous in, in that way. So they search the scriptures daily whether those things were so. What are they searching? What are they, if they, what scriptures are they searching? The New Testament hasn't even been written yet, has it? Paul used the Old Testament. And if you read Acts chapter 13, he gives that history lesson and, and goes all the way through the Old Testament to point Israel to the fact that their Messiah was Jesus Christ. And he, br he, brings, the, he brings Israel. What does Israel need? What did, what did they need in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? They needed to know that Jesus was the Christ. And so he brings them to that point, but he doesn't just stop there. Um, people today think that uh, that's all Paul taught in the book of Acts. Um, not so. But with a Jew, he had to, to establish, because Jesus Christ was a cuss word, kind of in those days. He was looked at as a religious nut, a religious zealot, um, he, he was rejected by his own people. 
So Paul had to first demonstrate to those Jews that Jesus Christ really was God's son. But then he took them beyond his gospel. That he gave his, he didn't just come to save his people from their sins. He gave his life a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And every man can, can receive the forgiveness of sins um, through belief and faith in him. So it's, it's just wonderful there. Um, it's natural that he would use the Old Testament. In fact, the, the great statement on the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, what? According to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. But Paul taught, he took, he took the event of Calvary, which was according to the scriptures, and expanded it according to his gospel message and, and program. So um, the, these Bereans were, were wonderful Bible students. Be a student of God's word. Verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So they're, they're checking out Paul's message and have to line it up with the events and oh yeah, this Jesus really was the Son of God. Therefore, therefore, verse 12, many of them did what? Believed. What did they? Uh, what, what did they do first? They searched the scriptures. Now there's something about this. This demonstrates the point of Calvinism. Calvinism says that man is so dead in trespasses and sins he cannot believe the gospel. Therefore, because it's Calvinism, the underwriting principle of Calvinism is God selects by sovereign choice before the foundation of the world who's going to be saved and who's going to, who's going to be lost. And because they're so dead in trespasses and sins, they can't believe the gospel. And they also believe faith is a work. They believe that if you, if you can believe the gospel, somehow you can boast, well, I believe the gospel. You know, and that therefore it's a notorious materi a materi a work. Um, is acknowledging that you can't do anything and that you're a sinner and dead in trespasses and sins and the judgments, the, the, the wages of sin is death and I can't save myself, um, is that doing anything? That's resting in what God says and you receive eternal life as a free gift. Now, the interesting thing here, the, the, the Calvinist says that God has to regenerate the person, that is, give them the faith, then they believe the gospel, and everybody else kind of goes on in their darkness, you know, just getting what they deserve because they couldn't believe. Now, the, the interesting thing about here is, if you want to talk about faith, where does faith come from? Can you think of a verse? I know Jim knows a verse. It's a verse we use, use on our radio program. Uh, Romans 10, 17, where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So what, what you see here, and you see that in Paul's epistles. Let me remind you, go back to Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, Paul has ministry here in Antioch, um, and he, he's ministering in the Sabbath day. Um, the congregation breaks up, and the Gentiles say, hey, we want to hear this again next week. They've been hearing what Paul is preaching. Um, they gather the next week and Paul preaches once again verse number 48 1348 when the Gentiles heard this what they hear that Paul has a new ministry out among the Gentiles they've been listening, listening to him preach when the Gentiles heard this they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as was ordained to eternal life believe a Calvinist takes that verse and says well, see, God ordained people to believe and get saved. Well, you forget what's been, what's been leading up to this. These people have a positive heart. They're listening. They're eager to learn. God put the power in the message, beloved. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for 
It is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, the word of God itself, it's living. It's a life-giving seed. And there's power in the gospel to those who will make the personal choice to believe it. The Bible says, To him that worketh not, but believeth. His faith is counted for righteousness. Faith is not a notorious work. So these people ordained to eternal life, that's a, that's a verse that talks about structure and order, the word ordained, to put in order. I love the order. They hear, the, the word of God bears witness to them, and they believe it. As many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Chapter 14, verse 1, they came, came to pass um, in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude of the Jews and also the Greeks did what? They believed. See, the issue of the word of God. Hebrew, um, Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 16, Lydia. We looked at Lydia here a couple weeks ago. And um, see, these are all verses that a Calvinist will use to demonstrate that God has to give people the faith in order to believe. Lydia, uh, verse 14, a certain woman... Acts 16, 14, named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, worshiped God, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended unto the things which were spoken by Paul. See, God had to open her heart so she could believe. Well, she, she's already a Jew. She's in a Gentile city. She's regularly going outside the city to pray. She's already got a heart for the things of the Lord as an unsaved Gentile, dead in trespasses and sins. But see, the book of, book of Acts 17 says that they might seek the Lord. The Bible doesn't say um, there's none that can seeketh after, seek after God. It says there's none that, that do. Well, here you have some people that, that, that have that, that mindset, and they respond to the word of God. You see the same thing in, in the... In the um, in Thessalonica um, they receive the word with all readiness of mind they're searching the scriptures daily whether those things were so therefore verse 12 17 12 many of them believed the word therefore why did they believe because they searched the scriptures and God's word bear bear witness to their heart and where does faith come from faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God so it's 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 a subtle thing but it demonstrates that, see, the, the issue of volition. We've been teaching about these institutions in, uh, uh, you know, volition and marriage and family and nationalism. The very first thing God did was give man the ability to choose. He told Adam and Eve, we told Adam, and then Adam kind of watered it down as he ministered to his wife, uh, commanded the man saying, of every tree of the, uh, in the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die see man is accountable and responsible to just believe what God says and trust God so um, the, the, there's, there's some lessons there now let's move on so they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so therefore verse 12 many of them believed also of the honorable women which were, were, which were Greeks and of men not a few so we really only have three verses here about this church in Berea. And, and so, so we don't have a lot of information in the book of Acts. We don't have the epistle to the Bereans. But the Berean church here is one of those Macedonian churches. You've got Thessalon Thessalonica, you've got Philippi in that region, and you've got Berea. And so Paul, we don't have to have an epistle of every single city and church where Paul went and ministered. But um, we can take, we can take the, uh, the information we do have in some of these other churches, and Paul certainly, that's what he, what he taught there at Berea. So it, it's, a, it's a marvelous thing. So, therefore many of them believed, of the honorable women, and of, which were Greeks, and of men not a few. So the church at Berea is established. We've just had the church at Thessalonica established. Chapter 16, we've had the church at Philippi. Paul is permeating the region there, the area of Macedonia, and establishing local churches in these individual cities. 
Now notice verse 13. This is something that's kind of interesting too. You know what the number, you're going to, you know, thir the number 13? Um, 13 in the Bible, it's interesting. Biblical num numerology is kind of interesting. 13 is the number of rebellion. And here you have a 13th verse. Um, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge, had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea. Now look at, you've got, you've got Thessalonica and you've got Berea. Those are two cities that are extremely close together. I don't know what the actual distance is. But how did, how did the Jews at Thessalonica that just ran Paul out of town, how did they hear that the same thing is going on just next door in Berea? It must mean those Thessalonians were busy preaching the gospel. And we're going to see that in, in the morning service here. Um, the Thessalonians, it says, the word of God spread, sounded out the word of the Lord. And what you see is those same Jews that got those lewd fellows of the baser sort and assaulted the house of Jason and persecuted that church at Thessalonica. They say, hey, he's, he's working over there in Berea. And they go after him. There's a special intensity of those Jews at Thessalonica. Um, and it demonstrates something about the hardness and the, 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 the anger of the Jewish people against the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And we see in the book of Acts, first Israel's envy and hatred for the little flock in Jerusalem. Remember? All those people, that, that ministry grows and all those Jews are, 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 are living there in Jerusalem. And the leadership in Israel, the scribes and the Pharisees, the builders that had stumbled at that stumbling stone, begin to raise persecution and drive that church out of Jerusalem. And they scatter. That's intense hatred. Well, you see the same bitterness and anger from God's chosen people who were to be a light to the Gentiles. And a light, you know, in, in, in God's plan and purpose, causing, hindering things. Acts 13, Paul's first miracle. There was a Jew that sought to turn the deputy away from the faith. The book of Acts is showing us by these, by these events, it's demonstrating some things about what's taking place on a, on a, on, in a bigger picture here with the nation of Israel and with Paul's Gentile ministry. There's, some, there's something interesting here. Go to the book of 1 Thessalonians and look at these, these Thessalonian Jews. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 14 to 17. Here is some doctrine in Paul's epistles that explain some things in the book of Acts. You read the book of Acts in light of Paul's epistles, not Paul's epistles in light of the book of Acts. Paul writes to those Thessalonians. Now think, think in your mind about the intense persecution that was there and the Jews driving Paul out of the city. Um, one of the underlying themes of Thessalonians is they were a suffering church. Uh, tremendous persecution there. Verse 14, For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. Now uh, you stop and you read that and you say, followers of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea. That's the little flock, isn't it? Now, the thing is, he's not talking about you follow them in doctrine. He's not saying you guys believe the same thing what he's saying is you became followers suffering the same things that those churches in, in Judea suffered of the Jews. Now he says that in Judea which were in Christ Jesus, for ye have suffered. He's not talking about following them in doctrine. You have suffered like things of your own countrymen. The Gentiles were, were together with the Jews persecuting the Thessalonians here even as they, the churches of Judea, have of the Jews. Those Jews in, in, in and around Jerusalem were suffering at the hands of their kinsmen. The, the Thessalonian church were suffering at the hands of the Gentiles and the Jews. And he's saying you're suffering those things. Now look at verse 15. 
the Jews, the end of verse 14, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. There's your Old Testament history, right? You have, you have faithful people in Israel, but you have the prophets rising up and protesting and trying to call the nation to repentance. And what happened? Jeremiah got thrown in jail and, and the, the, the prophets were persecuted. They didn't like the, the, the call to repentance. They persecuted, they killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they please not God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak unto the Gentiles. The Jews were the chief opponents of the new program going out among the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles fought against it too. We saw that in Philippi, right? The, 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 the guys who were using a little girl as a sorceress and witchcraft and all that stuff, their meal ticket was taken away from them. But as you read the book of Acts, it's obvious that the Jewish people, it's the Jews that got Paul arrested in Acts 21, and it's the Jews that chased him all the way through Caesarea and, uh, and before the, the, the monarchs Agrippa and Festus wanting this he's not fit for this man to live they're hindering God's word going out notice verse 7, 16 forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that that they might be, be saved to fill up their sins always for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. Well, interesting. I thought the wrath of God was the tribulation period. Well, it is. But here, it, it talks about Israel's opposition. They kill the Lord, and they're opposing Paul. He says, he uses this phrase, to fill up their sins, always. It's, like, it's as though God, sa God sits back and he watches, and he watches sin begin to manifest itself and manifest itself and manifest itself and finally it reaches a point where he does something about it fill up their sins all way go back to the book of go back to Genesis chapter 15 there's a phrase like this um, back in back in the book of Genesis as the Gentile nations go on in their darkness and their unbelief after God calls out Abraham you see some things running parallel look at this promise that God makes to Abraham Genesis 15, verse 6 is where he believes the promise about the, the stars in the sky. So then they have this, this promise down in verse 13. Then he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a strange land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and, that shall, and shall afflict them 400 years. Here's a, here's a preview of what the rest of the book of Genesis is about and the affliction that Israel at when they go down into Egypt um, Jacob and the, and, the, and the descendants of Joseph and that nation grows there um, will afflict them 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve that's the Egyptians will I judge and afterward they shall come out with great substance there's a prediction of the exodus and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. It's going to take some time for this process to run its course. Verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is what? Not yet full. Now, the, the, think of how young civilization and everything is here. You've only got you know a couple thousand years, and he started over after the flood and he started over after the Tower of Babel he says the, the, the iniquity of the Amorites hasn't reached its fullness yet but it, 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 it indicates that it will at some point and God will begin to work and he'll take Israel out of Egypt and begin to use them to you know as an instrument going to conquer the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and all those ites <laughs> and he's going to purge out the land and establish his nation but he says their iniquity is not yet full go up to go, go to go to Matthew chapter 23 the Lord says the same thing in the shadow of the cross Matthew chapter 13 I believe it's Matthew chapter 13 yeah verse 29 to 36 Matthew chapter 23 
from verse 13 on, the Lord is, is speaking directly to the scribes and Pharisees. You hypocrites, you bunch of snakes in the grass, you generation of vipers, um, you fools and blind, and he's just blistering these people. Verse number 29, Matthew 23, 29, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. Yeah, they had a sense of history. They honor the prophets. <laughs> but look at what the Lord says and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Oh, not us. We would have honored the prophets and we would have recognized the prophets but our, you know, our, our forefathers, they were, they were awful. What's, that, what's Donna? Matthew 23, verse 30. If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Verse 33. Look what the Lord does. <laughs> Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Ooh! <laughs> you know, you know why? What did the prophets talk about? They talked about the coming Messiah. They talk about Israel's history, about Israel's future, and the Redeemer's going to come. Well, guess what? The Redeemer's there. Are they honoring the prophets? Hey, talk is cheap, right? <laughs> They're persecuting the one that the prophets talked about. <laughs> he says, Ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them that kill up, killed the prophets. Verse 32. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. The sin of, of Israel is, is reaching a climax. See, see the sense of history here? He says, verse 33. Ye serpents and generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? <laughs> see, see, he's, see what's his attitude toward religion? and religious talk he says wherefore I behold I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes some of them ye shall kill and crucify and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city you read that and you know that's a that's a prediction what's going to happen to the Jews as they enter into this you know the 70th week of Daniel the persecution right and there's going, to be, there's going to be the Antichrist and the people that join, and get, join together with him, some Jews, and they're going to be going after the little flock. They're going to be going after the, 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 that remnant of believers and going to be pressing them to take the mark of the beast and all those other things. He says, verse number, uh, you shall per thus persecute them from city to city. Verse 35, that upon you may come all the righteous blood upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, where does that go? That goes all the way back to Cain and Abel, right? And uh, Cain, Abel's brother that killed him, is a picture of the, the false religion of the Antichrist. You read Jude and First and Second Peter and some of those verses. He says, you guys, you're, you're the children of the, the people in time past and you're going to continue to do it? that the blood of, of, of righteous Abel under the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. That is a, that is a historical figure that was killed at the, right before the end of the captivity, uh, before Israel goes into Babylonian captivity. You know what he's saying here? He says, the wrath has been building and there's been opposition to God and his word and his truth all the way back from Cain and Abel all the way through the Old Testament up until the captivity. He says, fill ye up the measure of your fathers. It's going to come to a point where God's going to act. And the judgment here is going to be, you know, the, the tribulation period and ultimately the second coming. But you know, the kingdom and the second coming didn't come, did it? God judged Israel when he said he counted them in unbelief. And he and he cast them away nationally. He interrupted their program. And what did he do? He called Saul of Tarsus and sent him out with a message of grace and peace. Go back to Thessalonians there. First Thessalonians. What you see taking place in the book of Acts, and you see it described here in Paul's epistles, is just like Israel was filling up their sin 
in the time of Christ, going all the way through, the, through their Old Testament history, opposing God and his word and filling up their sin. Now Israel is filling up their sin, opposing Paul in his ministry. And when he says there, um, forbidding up, verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sin alway, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. That is a judgment where God says, okay, you want to go on in your own way, have at it. One of the most devastating things that you can do is give somebody over to their own sin. And um, that's what he does here. He's saying to Israel, they're going to go on in unbelief and they're going to reap the consequences for it. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak. And what you see is, is God, God is, gonna, is turning away from the nation of Israel and their national program and raising up a new program and, and ministering to the, to the entire world there. But he's provoking Israel. See, the reason Paul goes to the Jewish synagogues, he's got that heart for his kinsmen, doesn't he? I was just like them. I, did, I persecuted the Lord. I did it in ignorance and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And I was saved out of due time. And, uh, and Paul, during the book of Acts, is trying to provoke Israel to jealousy. God is not dealing through them any longer, is he? Because they fell and they were set aside. But God in his grace and in his love didn't just cut them off at the knees. Did they stumble that they should fall? God forbid. But through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles, he says in Romans 11. And he says, I'm the apostle of the Gentiles and I magnify my office. If by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh, my kinsmen, my unbelieving kinsmen who are just like me and might save some of them. And you see, when you see Paul's provoking ministry in the book of Acts, don't mistake it for the king, like he's offering them the kingdom, you know, and, and it's all one program. Now, Paul and the sign gifts, God, God gives the Gentiles the gifts, doesn't he? Gives the Gentiles Israel signs. Why? <laughs> to provoke them. Because the Jews require a sign. Their sign program passed off the scene. Now you got a bunch of Gentiles speaking in tongues and miracles and healings and so on. It was a sign of the new program, of the new apostleship, and the new message. And you see that through the book of Acts there. Paul is doing that. It's, it's a marvelous thing. Go back to Acts 17. Uh, I want to finish up here. Um, what you see, when, when you see the opposition of Israel, notice, I tell you, do something when you go home. Google the phrase, the Jews. And, and limit it to the book of Acts. And you'll see, I, I don't forget, I did it years ago, I don't know how many times it's there, but how many times it's negative. You know, it's un, the Jews, the Jews moved with envy, the Jews sought to kill Paul, and so on. It's demonstrating, the book of Acts is demonstrating Israel's unbelief, filling up their sins always, spurning the grace of God in the last half of the book of Acts and Paul's new ministry, just like they spurned the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the little flock in the first half of the book of Acts. And you see that in, in Acts. And by, by the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, you see God is through reaching out and, and trying to provoke Israel and so on. And the book of Acts closes with Paul as a prisoner in Rome, and he says the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and they'll hear it. But this people, their heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing. It's a, it's a, he quotes the Isaiah. And it, it's just a, Israel is just demonstrating their history. And God just leaves them, lets them go. And uh, he, he turns, and now for 2,000 years, he's got this program going out among the Gentiles. So verse 13, Acts 17, 13, the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached to Paul and Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. And immediately, then, then immediately, the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea, 
but Silas and Timotheus abode there still. It says, though Silas and Timothy are kind of in the background, aren't they? Paul is the lightning rod, but, but they stay there at Berea and for some additional ministry. Verse 15, And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving commandment unto, unto Silas and Timotheus for to come unto him with all speed, they departed. Now we don't have time to, to talk. I'm going to share some things with you about that next week. But Paul is, is in Berea, gets run out of town, and then heads down to Athens. And now the rest of Acts chapter 17, we have Paul's ministry at Athens, um, the center of, of uh, education and, and philosophy and um, high, uh, learning there in the, in the Greek Empire, a key place. And we're going to see Paul's ministry and approach in the Gentile world again. But I want to make one point as we quit. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, because he's gone down to Athens and some people traveled with him, and he sends them back, says, tell, Tim tell Timothy and Silas to come quickly. Um, there's obviously Paul's burden for this Gentile city. Well, Paul waited for them at Athens. His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. He gets there. He sees the idolatry and the spiritual darkness he tells the guys that traveled with him, go back and get Silas and Timothy and, and tell them to come with all speed because there's, you know, there, there, this is a dark place and there's ministry opportunity there. Verse 17, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, there's the Jewish synagogue once again, and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. He's got public ministry there at Athens and he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to come and help him. There's this great opportunity there. But I want you to notice verse 16. Paul got stirred up when he came to Athens. What stirred him up? Idolatry. The spiritual darkness stirred Paul up. Not the politics, not the immorality and the darkness of the culture. He got stirred up when he saw the spiritual darkness there. And it energized him to do what? Go to City Hall? <laughs> no. Go in the marketplace and do what? Preach the gospel. May God help us to get stirred up. Yes, there's a lot of things in our society and in our history and in our culture that's, that's falling by the wayside. And I'm grateful for people that, that want to be out there and, and fighting for liberty. But you know, let them have at it. I'm grateful. <laughs> but what do we need to be, what battle need we be fighting? The issue of the truth. We're not going to save the culture. We're not going to redeem society. God's given us the opportunity to rescue the individuals out of that darkness and give them life in Christ Jesus through the gospel. May the spiritual darkness stir us up to be about what God has given us to do. Amen? And uh, if we get stirred up by the other stuff, God help us if we're not twice as stirred up about this stuff. Amen? Because what's God's will? That all men be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. I love that. I love that. Um, and, uh, well, there's more I could say about that. But do you have a question or a comment? Okay. Do you understand that thing about filling up their sins all way and provoking. That's what Paul's doing in the book of Acts. He's not preaching the kingdom gospel. He's not ministering to the little flock. God is through dealing through Israel you know in the kingdom and the covenants and the promises but he's not through dealing with Israel. Paul is out there with a heart for his kinsmen trying to save some of them into the new program. Okay? All right. Father, thank you for the opportunity to study these things. We, we thank you for your word and how exciting the book of Acts is as we see these things transpire. And that we thank you for the color that we can fill in and the, the, the commentary that we can fill in as we go to his epistles and understand what his ministry really is, what he's preaching and teaching. And Lord, may we be instructed by these things 
and the example of our apostle to be about what you've given us to do in our dark world that we might shine as lights and hold forth the word of life. We thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.